Thank you for joining and welcome to this uh, workshop. This is chapter three, Wings of Innovation. And there is a reason why it has trans transitioning and containerization in the title. But let us begin before that with an introduction. My name is Ahmed. I am, uh, uh, I have, I'm, I've been working with, uh, with SANS for the past three, four years now. I teach SIC 540, which is a class about DevOps, security, cloud uh, automation, and so on. And this is a big part of it, Kubernetes, and how do you scale that, and how do you secure it? In addition to that, I also work with Lacework uh, as a customer, as in the customer success organization. Uh, I am based in San Francisco as of recently, actually three weeks. Um, I'm interested in cloud security, obviously, but also recently Gen AI. So I've been doing some research on that, and this would be a good opportunity to talk about Gen AI as well uh, in a minute in here. Aside from that, outside, outside from work, uh, I'm interested in martial arts, in specific jujitsu. Please feel free to reach out. This is my LinkedIn, and feel free to shoot me an email uh, at any point. So with that, I am part of the cloud curriculum, and the cloud curriculum probably has uh, a list of different uh, courses that we have. The SIC 540 is the one I teach. We have others as well. Please take a, mo a moment to look at that uh, when, when, you have, when you have the time. Now, for this session, uh, and I promise you the rest of the slides are a little bit better than this, but we have two main objectives. The primary one is to learn about Kubernetes, right? So if you have not seen Kubernetes before, maybe you have it in your own, in your environment, in your company where you work, uh, you want to get familiar with it, this is the workshop for you. We're going to go through the process of building an application or deploying an application on a Kubernetes cluster. So we'll see a few examples of that. There is a secondary objective, though. And the secondary objective is that the application we're going to build is actually a Gen AI application. We're not going to focus too much on that unless you guys have specific questions. Feel free uh, to shoot those and we can have a conversation. Again, we can also carry on the conversation in the Discord channel as well. But that's the secondary objective. Now, there, is, there are reasons why we want to set these two objectives. See, in security, the idea is we need to understand the technology before we can actually secure it. So hence, this, uh, this workshop where we're going to understand Kubernetes and to do it a little bit to Gen AI. Now, the way it's going to work is that we're going to go through these slides and we're going to talk about Kubernetes, talk about some of the concepts, why do we need it, why, how is it useful, uh, what are some of the things we need to worry about, and then we're going to break it into a practical portion of the workshop. Um, there is a link in the chat that basically take you to the aviata.cloud link where you will have a set of instructions that you will need to do. Uh, we will we have four different tasks. We will do specific tasks, then come back, then walk through them, talk about them, and then go back and continue with the, with the rest of it. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but for now, let us begin the actual um, discussion. Image. So the first thing we want to touch on is the idea of containers. Now, while this is not about containers, containers is basically the foundation. We have Kubernetes because we needed containers. And what containers are, are basically a method for us to deliver applications or deliver software that we write in a complete packaged fashion, right? Um, the idea is that, hey, I'm going to create this application. I want to give it to you with everything that application needs for it to run, meaning every, uh, every prerequisites, every libraries, et cetera, right? And once I do that, you can run this application almost at any platform you want. Now, this has opened a lot of, of discussion, right? How does that work? How does that affect the application processing? The basic idea is we can build a container. We need to store this. We can build an image. We want to store this image in a some sort of a, of a registry, uh, for example, the Docker Hub. And then we're going to use it, right? So we have Docker Hub where we're going to store these images and then everyone or like specific people can use that. More details is in the link. Uh, this is a hands-on workshop about Docker in specific, but that's an introduction for us to have. Now, with that understanding, uh, Docker has changed the way applications work. That has caused a little bit of a problem. And it's the problem that Kubernetes is addressing at this point. The problem is with containerization, now applications can be broken into smaller pieces. There are many advantages why people do that, right? The microservices architecture. 
But the basic idea is instead of having a gigantic application, like one Amazon.com, one gigantic application, we're going to break it into microservices. Uh, and each one of them could do something unique, something specific. And each, each section or each component of, the, of each microservice is going to interact with the others. Containerization allowed for this to happen. The illustration that we have in front of us has a backend and a front end, and then some sort of a database. So we have three components, which is exactly what we're going to build. And each one of these components could be one container or more. You know, we scale up and we, then we scale down. So if you really think about it, this is a great idea. It has a lot of benefits. It does have security challenges, right? But the main thing is when you scale up and down, now you have hundreds, maybe thousands of containers running inside your environment. Now, if you have ever worked with Docker and creating uh, containers and shutting them down, that's a lot of headache. So there was, a, there was a need for some sort of a solution that manages this, this containerized environment. So with that, Kubernetes was born. And the idea of Kubernetes is that we're going to create a solution, well, it was created by Google, um, that, would man that would help us to manage all of this workload. So what do I mean by that? Well, it will help us to deploy the application. It will help us to scale it up and down. It will help with networking. It would help with uh, managing some of the images uh, and then adding some security as well. Now, the Kubernetes project is now, uh, is now supported by CNCF. Follow their website. They have created a lot of great things. Now, with that, the Kubernetes itself was designed for scaling up and down, as we mentioned earlier. And there are many flavors uh, for it, right? So for example, if you are in the cloud, you can use the AWS EKS, which is the Elastic Kubernetes Service, which is a managed Kubernetes that they give you. See, the thing about Kubernetes is that it can be a little bit challenging to set up, right? If you want to go and configure it yourself, there are so many components, and we will cover some of them in the next few slides. But the idea is, because this is very challenging, the cloud providers and others have created managed solutions. So right now you can go to AWS and you can say, create Kubernetes cluster, and it will be created for you. All of the management parts are done for you. You still have to understand how it works and how to administer the Kubernetes cluster uh, that was created. Now, in addition to the systems that scale up a lot, we also have smaller ones, um, things that can be put on IoT devices. Now, in this lab, we're going to use Minikube. And Minikube is a small uh, deployment of a, of, a, of a Kubernetes cluster. It will create one cluster with one node, which we will be deploying things on it. Minikube can be run on your own local machine, right? On your own laptop. You can also run it in a VM, which is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to launch a VM. We're going to run everything we need inside Minikube, inside that VM that we have. But don't worry. We got you for that. Everything is automated. All right, sounds good so far. Let's talk a little bit about the process. How does that work? Well, we did mention that containers are at the heart of it. So it all begins with building a container image, storing this image some in some sort of a, um, a, a container registry. After that, one of the components within a Kubernetes deployment is going to reach out to this container registry it's going to pull this image and then deploy a container, as simple as that. Now, this is an example, right? And usually this is done via CI, CD. This is a topic that we touch on in, in SEC 540. Um, but how do we interact with that? So let's take a look at this. We do have, we, we do have the, um, the kubectl. The kubectl is a command line tool. You have it, you will have it installed on your virtual machine. And this is how we're going to interact with the cluster that we're going to create. So when we say interact, that means we're going to create resources, maybe make changes to some, and then finally deleting resources as we need. We have some examples, example commands that we can use in here, right? So for example, we can say something like kubectl apply and then give it some parameters. And what that will do is apply some sort of a, um, a, a some sort of a resource that we need. And if you look at line, and you can see my, my cursor. Yeah, I think you do. So you have we have dmwebpod.yaml, and that YAML file will describe what is it that you want to apply. We will see what that looks like in a second. 
We can do other things as well, right? We can say kubectl get pods, and we will understand what pods is in, in a minute. Um, but we can get information about the resources that we created. So pod is a resource that we created. Uh, we can also get information, get more information. We can get logs. And then finally, we can say, hey, delete this resource. I don't need it anymore, or I don't like it anymore. All right, sounds good so far. So how does, how does that YAML file look like? Well, uh, again, as we walk through the labs, we will go into the details and look at some of these uh, YAML files. We have a bunch of them for you today. But this is an example, right? And look at this. It has four main components. It has an API version. And the reason why it has an API version is because it will communicate with the API server inside the Kubernetes itself. And then it has kind, which is line number two, as you see here. And this one says pod. So I would like to create a resource of type or of kind pod. And uh, pod is basically the smallest component that we can create in a Kubernetes cluster. And the pod can have one container or more. When we say pod, automatically you should think of container, even though it could have it could be multiple containers in that. For our example, a pod is going to be one container. Um, there are other resource types as well. Now we have other information. So this, this deployment or this pod has a name. Uh, so line number four says the name is simple pod, right? It also has labels. So look at line number six through eight. Uh, we have labels that we will use to interact with this pod from a configuration standpoint later on, right? And then finally, we have the specifications. What is it exactly that you want to create? I would like to create a pod that has a container, and that container should use this image, line number 12. There are many configurations as well. All right. So with that, for those of us who are on the Discord channel, put a thumbs up if you guys are following so far. Also, paste your, your questions in there. All right, here's another example of another type of resource that we would create, which is called a deployment. Um, very similarly, right? We have a name, uh, we have a namespace that we will, that we will talk about. Uh, and then we have a bunch of other configuration as well. Notice line eight through 10, it basically says, hey, selector, this thing, app, web, right? This refers to the previous, uh, to a previous resource that we created uh, earlier. It seems like we have so many different types of resources. So let's talk about some of them. So the first thing is a namespace, right? And uh, namespaces is the way we're going to separate our application uh, from other applications. You see in Kubernetes, you usually have maybe one deployment or more. And you could have multiple teams creating or working on different projects. And you do not want your application to interact with others, right? There has to be some sort of an isolation in there. So security one on one. Inside this namespace that we're going to create, we will create multiple pods. And as a matter of fact, we're not going to create pods directly. We're going to create a deployment. So the deployment will automatically create certain pods for us. Now there are many resources, right? Many resource, many uh, resource types. So a volume is basically an abstract. That's a desk essentially at the end of the day, right? We will also create a configuration map and a secret. The configuration map and a secret is a way for us to store data that needs to be shared among different components of the application that we are building. Remember how we said it's microservices now? So each microservice is a different component that could be a different pod or set of pods, right? Sometimes they need to, to interact. So what's an example of that? Well, think about an application that has a database and that application needs to access the database using the username, password, IP, and the database name. That's a pretty common thing to have in a typical web application with a database in it, right? How do you share this information? Well, you store this information in a configuration map or better, a secret, because this is sensitive data. And then the pod will automatically reach out and fetch this information and use it inside the application itself. We also have a service. And the service is basically us saying, hey, this pod, this is a group of containers needs to have an needs to be exposed externally. Well, not externally fully, but externally within the cluster that we have. And then we can use the ingress to actually expose it with an external IP address. Ingress is not the only way we can do that. We can also add a load balancer as well. All right, with that, I think that's enough as an introduction for like what 
uh, what containing R. With that, let me pause a little bit and see if there are any questions about Kubernetes itself before we get into what are we going to do for the rest of the session. So drop your questions if you have any, and I'll give it a minute. All right, it seems that we are good. Okay, so with that, everything that we have covered, we would go over again, but with, with an actual exam. So what is it that we're going to build? Let's get to it. Well, we're going to build the Aviata chatbot. And this is a very, very simple application. The application is basically an abstract on top of ChatGPT. Um, and it has three components. The first component is a front end, which is a, which is a web interface. And the web interface will basically allow us to interact with the, with the chat, essentially. That also has a back end. So the web interface is going to receive our requests and then it's going to send our request to the back end. The back end is basically based on Python. So the front end is HTML and Java. Obviously, it will run in your browser. And then the back end is basically Python based. Uh, it's an API server that listens to specific requests. So it will do a very similar thing, but it doesn't have an interface. The back end is going to reach out to multiple places. Most importantly, the OpenAI APIs. So that's an external entity. For the back end to, to be able to do that, it will need a secret. And the secret is an, uh, is an, is an API secret for the OpenAI uh, APIs. We will provide that for you, right? And you will be able to use it inside your virtual machine. Um, but we will disable that after the workshop. If you want to continue to use it, you have to go to OpenAI and create your own. But for the sake of the lab, we will give that uh, for you. Now, we also have a DB, a database, in specific, a vector DB. Um, please share your thoughts if you, if you know what a vector DB is or had experience with it. But the basic idea is that when we create, when we create Gen AI applications, you can have an interface where you can ask the model itself, but if but you also could in, could have some specific information and data inside this database that the chat app is going to use to answer questions for you. The example that that we have basically has a bunch of research that was done by Sans, and this research is stored in that uh, Victor DB that we have. All right. So with that, oh, one one thing I forgot. This entire thing, right? Everything in red, which is what we are going to create needs to be able to reach out to a container registry and needs to pull three different images. So the first image is for the front end. The second image is for the back end. The third Docker image is for the VV database. So three different components, three different images. We will pull them and then we will deploy the, uh, the infrastructure that we have. These are the images that we need. They are all publicly available. And one thing you notice is that the VV8 one is actually coming from VV8 itself. So we will download that. We will do some configuration, not really part of, of this lab, but you have the code. You can go through it and then you can submit questions and play with it if you want. The front end and the back end actually live in my own registry, right? They are already pre built for you. You just have to use them. All right. So with that, to get started, we need to go into the aviata.cloud and we have two set of instructions for you. The first one is a setup and the setup is going to be, hey, I'm going to log into my AWS account uh, using my own credentials. I will open the cloud shell and then I will run the command that you see in here. Uh, this thing will install the infrastructure that is needed in the back end. This is actually Terraform. It's going to build your virtual machine. Once that is done, you can follow the instruction to set up the proxy. And let me actually switch ahead and show you the, how the proxy looks like. So you would have something like this, like this is my cloud shell, and you can deploy the command that we have. Once you do that, you would have the smart proxy and you would have something that looks like ACE13 range. This will allow you to map certain services that we have externally, right? So you will be able to access them from your machine. So what are these systems, right? There is a big list of things. The most important one is that we will have Microsoft VS Code. Uh, you can access it via, by going to code.sans.lab. Your proxy is going to take care of mapping, so you should have access to it right away. This is where we are going to work, right? We will be applying commands here if you want to. 
you will if you want if you need to make changes to any files you can do that here we will not need to for this uh, for the instructions but later on that can be useful there are other things um, that come with the virtual machine feel free to explore it and spend some time uh, there so with that let's give it some 15 minutes for the setup oh sorry I forgot this is the main page of the other that cloud and then if you go down this is the getting started guide I'm going to click on it the getting started guide is going to guide you through all of the AWS the proxy uh creating the VM etc and once you have that let's scroll all the way down once you have that these are the systems that are going to be uh accessible for you this is VS code there's a terminal as well there are a bunch of other things uh, as well so to log in to anything you would use student and the password is start the labs I would type that for you in the chat with all characters so it writes like that start the labs so this would be the password if you need to access the terminal in here so with that once you go through that the next step is to go through the actual uh what the uh the actual manual so if you click on the manual it will give you the instructions this is task one two three and then four five is just a cleanup right so we have four tasks for you let's take 15 minutes let's go through the getting started and go through task number one once we come back we will walk through that and then we will take it from here uh, I forgot to mention uh, I saw that Ben actually answered one of the questions about secrets let me pull that up and the question was uh, just for though if, if we have anyone who's not on the um on the chat uh, does the secret management have an integration point with other commercial products like CyberOp? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, I'm not uh, so Ben's answer is I'm not certain about CyberArk specifically, but yes, there are integrations with many providers. Uh, ben has worked with AWS Secret Manager, Parameter Store, OnePass, HashiCorp Vault. These are all things that we actually explore in the SIG 540 class. Uh, but yes, that's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, all right. So with that, I'm going to set the timer. Or I'm going to set it for 15 minutes. If you guys need more time, let me know. We are still good on time. We can add a few more minutes. Otherwise, we will come back. We will walk through the installation and then step one. And then once we finish, we will go back and do step two. Yes, a reminder. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, we are only supporting US East 2 Ohio. So that is. If you want to go to let me go back here in your AWS account, you want to be in Ohio. Right now, that's the limitation. So go to US East 2 and then follow the steps. All good. Put thumbs up if you guys are still following. Otherwise, put some questions. All right, we will see you in 14 minutes. Now remember. You, this will be available for you forever, right? So even if you are squeezed a little bit in time, um, you can always go back to it and do it from the ground up. The only thing that you will need to get back is the uh, is the key. Get your own sorry, uh, is the OpenAI key. Let me pull that and uh, I'll share that with everyone. So this is the key and you're supposed to store it in this file inside your VM. Now this key will be available for the next two hours and then after that obviously it's going to be disabled. Someone asked in the chat if we are okay to destroy everything now. So no, do not destroy it now. Wait until the last, the end of it uh, and then you can destroy it. You can leave it for like an hour or so if you want, if you feel like you still need to do some work. Um, but yeah, do not destroy it now. <laughs> also, the code for the uh, for the deployment uh, for, for the application and for the Kubernetes deployment is actually on a repo that's public. So you don't really need the VM. You can just like use that uh, with whatever. You can download Minikube locally, and then you can do your work. Uh, so you don't actually need the VM. It's just that the VM is more consistent. It's tested. It's, it's guaranteed to work well. I should say almost guaranteed to work.
Uh, so Brian, uh, Brian's have a question about where to begin. So Brian, you begin by going to here, the aviata.cloud, and then this is chapter three, right? You scroll down a little bit and you will see the getting started guide. You begin there. So you log into your, the gist of it is you log into your AWS account uh, and then you go to Cloud Shell. Uh, it's all explained here. And you will install the uh, the proxy on Firefox. Um, this is this walks you through the add-on, how you install it, etc. And then once that is done, you go into the cloud shed. You need to be in Ohio, uh, and then you scroll down, and then you apply these sets of commands. So you go into this directory, and then you apply this. Uh, so this will download the actual Terraform package that you have. And then the next one is a bash script that will deploy or apply Terraform. And that will build a virtual machine. The virtual machine, then you will need to access it. And then you'll begin the lab from there. Once you have access to the virtual machine, you can go to, uh, let me go back here. You can go to the chapter three workshop manual and you can begin here. And task one uh, is basically making sure that Minikube is done. It is. It should be automatically deleted. And then the next step is to start Minikube and set a few minor things. All right, I think we are good in time. Uh, should, we, should we go through the walkthrough for this lab? Thumbs up if you guys are good. I see a few people still uh, setting up the proxy, all right. Uh, there is actually, before we go through the walkthrough, let me just go back to the slides. We have one more thing to talk about before we actually look at what we have uh, built so far. So let me go back here. And um, I really like this graph because it shows, like it's an illustration that shows how the different components of a Kubernetes cluster work together. Uh, so when we say components to begin with, there are the components of the chat app that we're building, the Aviata chat app. And there are components for the Kubernetes itself, for the Kubernetes system. So if we look at this, this is the components that make up the cluster. So we can break it into two separate parts, the control plane, and then what's running inside the worker nodes. This is what Minikube has created for us. So check this out. We have a control plane, this one right here, and it has many components, including an API server. You guys remember that kubectl command? Every time you issue any command, that command goes to this API server. This API server will receive your command. So for example, apply like whatever resource you need, right? And it will take the action for it. Everything that it does will be stored in this etcd component, which is more like a, like a ledger. It has logs of everything that's happening and other components inside the cluster has access to it. And they will see when you do, when you make changes, and then they will react uh, based on that. Uh, this open, this, uh, this control plane will also communicate to a component called Kubelet. And the Kubelet usually runs on a worker node. A worker node could be a virtual machine, could be an EC2 instance, whatever you have. In our case, there is some sort of a virtual machine that was created by Minikube. So when we said Minikube creates a cluster with one node, that means a cluster with one virtual machine. Obviously, you can scale that, right? You can have a cluster that has 50 nodes, right? Each one of them is a virtual machine, and each virtual machine will be running containers on them. So the actual containers are running on these worker nodes, right? So the worker nodes are also in charge of, sorry, the kubelet is also in charge of everything that works within the Docker. So instead of you saying Docker run and Docker stop, that's what the kubelet is going to do. Now, inside the worker node, when you create certain components, so these are examples of components that we could create. Um, so this represents some sort of a namespace. We will create a namespace. We're going to call it uh, aviata-chatbot. And then all of our resources are going to live there. So for example, we will have pods, we will have uh, pods, we will have services, and we will have other things as well. It's also important to note that the namespace spans across multiple nodes in a production environment. In our case, we only have one node, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, if we are to build another application, 
which we will, we will create another namespace and then we will create those resources inside that other namespace. You can also notice that there are cloud control manager that talks to cloud providers. Um, and that has to do with cloud provider specific things. So for example, if you're using EKS and you're trying to publish an application, you probably need an AWS load balancer to pass the information, to pass the traffic to your uh, cluster. This is what's taken care of. Also, notice that the kubelet is the component or the entity that's going to reach out to the container registry. So once you say kubectl apply backend, that's the first thing, uh, actually the second thing that we're going to deploy. Once you do that, kubelet on a specific node is going to reach out to the container registry, download the right image according to your configuration, and then basically create the resources that you need. All right, any questions on this? Now, with that, I hope that most of us did manage to go into the VM. Let me just go and walk through that. Um, so this is my AWS account. Actually, this is my AWS account. And what we are going to do is go to Cloud Shell. And you can go to Cloud Shell simply by clicking this tiny thing. Uh, or you can search for Cloud Shell. And I have it open already, so Cloud. And Cloud Shell is just like a, like a small VM, right? It doesn't have a lot of resources, but it does have the AWS tools, right? So you can execute things and you have privileges in your AWS account. So you can build things. So for example, you can create Terraform code that would basically build uh, your infrastructure for you. The, once you. Once you log into that, you can execute. Let me go back to the, oh, not the getting started, um, this one. Uh, and you can execute this thing, right? It will download the Terraform code. And then from there, you can just execute with this parameter and this will generate the chapter three infrastructure that you need. Uh, let me go back to my Cloud Shell. You should be able to see something like this. Uh, so Terraform state list. And these are the things, I think I have, these are the things that were created once you set that command. Uh, and if you look closely, there's a VPC, there are a bunch of subnets, and there is an instance which we are going to run the lab. And everything is contained there, right? So once you finish, you definitely need to go back to the getting started and do the cleanup, which is somewhat down below. Um, is it towards the end? So you need to go into that folder and basically say Terraform destroy auto approve, and that will clean everything so that you do not accumulate costs. So this is very important. Don't do it now, later on. All right, so with that, let's talk about the proxy. So the proxy, the smart proxy will have profiles. What you need to do is go to the settings, go to backup and restore, and then restore a specific JSON file. And that JSON file, you should, be, you should have downloaded it, right? And you can download it in multiple ways. So once you run that Terraform, it will, guide you through it. And there are multiple ways to download it. One of them is just simply by going here and says download, and you can download this file. Let me show you that file. So this is what you're going to download, right? This will have the configuration for the smart proxy. And once you do that, you can open this file and take a look at it. Uh, once you download it and then set your smart proxy with it, you will be able to access your environment. So accessing your environment, let me go back uh, to the uh, startup getting started. And uh, there is a terminal, you can click on that and that will allow you to execute commands inside that virtual machine. So again, student, oops. I did not mean to do that. So student and then start the labs. And then now you are inside this virtual machine. You can tell because it has a name and your username is student. So do not execute commands outside of this, right? Uh, be aware that these are two different places where you can execute commands. All right, so you can also access, which is my recommendation, not necessarily, right? But getting familiar with the VS code uh, so this is a web version of the VS Code that is installed in the VM, and it will allow you a terminal in which you can basically execute whatever commands you need. So with that, once you're here, you can actually begin 
the lab. So let me walk through the lab. So this is what we are doing. Uh, so we're going to go into the first task, which is setting up the minikube. Now, your VM already has minikube installed. The delete is just a precaution. It's, it should not have any clusters. What this does is that it deletes clusters that you already have. Um, and then once you do that, we will basically execute uh, the start, which will start the cluster with specific uh, configuration in here. Notice that we are specifying a specific version of Kubernetes, right? There are multiple versions. We are also assigning a specific subnet that we will be using later on. And then we're also passing this thing. Calico is a third party component. This is also a requirement for Minikube. If you're, if you're working without Minikube, you do not need that per se, right? You're having it is, is better, but uh, you do not necessarily need it. But this is what will allow us to apply network access later on in step three. Uh, let's even see if there was a question. So Brian is asking, can I use Azure GCP uh, if you like, uh, or any other cloud provider? So, so Brian, only AWS is supported currently here, but on your own, you can fire up whatever virtual machine anywhere and you can install Minikube if you want to, and you can go through this outside of the Minikube instructions and it should be, should be fine. All right, so the next thing we did, uh, we installed the Minikube add-on, uh, which would add a bunch of things, among them a namespace, which says uh, Metal LB. And Metal LB is another project. Feel free to explore that. It's an additional information. Once you're done, you can check your work, right? Uh, you can check the status of Minikube. Let's run these one at a time. So let me do this. Actually. So this will make sure that Kubernetes is running, right? It will configure your uh, your Cube CTL as well. Oops. easier and then you can look at the cluster information because it created one cluster as we said so this is this is basically will verify that kubectl is in fact configured because you need authentication that minikube installation will take care of it and then finally you can take a look at the nodes notice that we're saying kubectl get nodes so let me go to that and there you go so get nodes you have control plane, et cetera, et cetera. Minikube is actually working. So let's see. So once you do that, the last step in, in one is to clone this repo. So let's talk about this repo before we go into uh, task two. So once you do that and you apply the metal config, uh, let me go here, you will have this thing right here. And this is the Aviata chat app. There are three folders. You do not have to worry about bin. This is what actually builds the two containers that you have, well, the ones that we need to build, but they're already pre-built for you. Uh, just if you're curious, what, what it does is that it builds this Docker image, right? And then it passes optional parameters if you need to later on, but then it pushes it to my repo. You can't do that because this is not, you can't really, you need to authenticate, but you can replace this with your own Docker Hub account. Um, you do not need to do that because I already published this here, so you can just pull it. Uh, it does have the deploy Kubernetes. These are what we're going to spend most of our time doing. And then it has the source as well for the back end and the front end. Feel free to explore that. If we have time, we will go over this. If not, then we'll leave this for some other time. With that, uh, let's go and finish up uh, task two. So go ahead and continue task, task, task two. Uh, unless you have a question, please feel free to drop it. So how do you access the VM? So there are multiple ways to access the VM. You don't need to actually log into the VM, but if you need to, all you have to do is go into the getting started. Press this. All you have to do is click on this terminal and basically you need to go to terminal.sans.wili and that will give you access to the VM. You do not need that because you can also execute commands from the VS code, but it's up to you. So to access the VS code, I'm gonna just uh, copy this and paste it here. So this link actually access the, uh, the code. I'm also going to copy this in 
let's say the site can't be reached. Well, you can use the terminal, right? So you have full access to that VM. Or do you need to go inside the container, which we will do? Uh, for everyone, feel free to go into task two. I already shared the key. You will need the key. So let me go to that configuration. So you will need to create a namespace called Aviata Chatbot. And then right after that, you will need to replace this thing with the key I shared with you. And then you want to save it in this file. From there, we're going to take this key and save it and, and create a secret with that key in it. All right, but we're going to hold on that. Uh, let's see, we're going to give it another 15 minutes for that. And let me know if you need more time. I would add more time. Meanwhile, please keep the questions coming. Ben and I will try to answer as fast as possible. So we have a question about after we sign in as student, what do you do? Once you sign in as student, you can go back to uh, here. Let me get you the instructions. And you can begin following these instructions. And I would put paste this here. There you go. Yes, Ben is having a note saying the sans.labs domain can only be accessed once smart proxy configuration is set. Smart proxy is the one that's going to publish this domain, and you can only access it locally, obviously, via that proxy. All right. Uh, please go through task number two. It's a little bit longer. And then once we come back, we will talk about that. So there is another question about the Minikube AWS Cloud Shell. So the, uh, the Minikube commands will run inside your terminal, sorry, will run inside the VM, not inside Cloud Shell. The only thing that's going to run inside Cloud Shell is the command that deploys your VM, which is this set right here. This is the only thing that you need to run inside your cloud shell. Everything else is inside the VM. We have a question about the secret and I'm looking at the command and I think, uh, I think you missed the arrow that basically stores that key in that file. So let me type it again. Oh, yeah, Ben answered that. Thank you, Ben. All right, good. So everything is good. You can always cat that file and you will be able to see if your secret is, it should be just that secret, right? Nothing before, nothing after. That value will be taken as is, placed in the secret inside Kubernetes, and then will be passed to the application, to the backend and to the Weaviate uh, instance. Now, the since we're waiting, uh, the Weaviate instance itself is not actually working right now for this uh, application, but it doesn't affect our lab. Uh, but it's there to basically, if we have time to talk about how that uh, Gen AI applications are working, what is what exactly that does, then we will do that. Um, but, uh, but right now, the only two components that are active that are working is the front end and the back end. Uh, we have a question about the high level objective of each task. Um, so the tasks are broken into sequentially, right? Um, so the first one is basically set up. Let me actually open the, uh, so the first one is basically setting up Minikube, right? This is needed for the lab. If you want to deploy this somewhere else, you don't need the specific one. Uh, then we're going to create the essential components that are needed for the application. So that would be your config file, config map, that would be your secret, anything in preparation, right? Um, and then the next one, the most important task we have is task three, which is deploying the actual application 
and we will deploy three components, the database, the VVA database, the back end and the front end. And as we do that, we will explore some of the uh, some of the uh, details in there. Task four is about network control. So we have this the settings, right? we have this application, all of it lives in one namespace, but there is no control as we will see in task four. We will try to create another application and then connect to it. And then we will explore uh, the network access and how we can control that. We will leave it at the network access. We have one network access policy that we will apply that will basically deny everything. And we do have the solution for it. So we have few others that will enable it, but I will leave that to you to figure out. So there's like a kind of uh, do your own thing later on, so to speak. Okay, so with that, should we walk through task number two? This should be quick. So what we have done, the first thing is we created a namespace, right? Every application has to be a namespace. So if you push some sort of, if you deploy an infrastructure without specifying a namespace, it will automatically go into the default namespace. When you create a cluster, you will have a namespace called default and everything will go there. Obviously this is not best practice. Uh, the next thing we wanna do is the secret. So we have open AI secret, the key, is used by the Avia, sorry, by the backend and by the WeVA DB to communicate back to OpenAI, right? Doesn't matter what it does with it. The important thing is that this key needs to exist inside the container itself once we create a container. And because we want to keep it in a secret manner, right? In, 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 a, in a secure way, we will create this resource called secret. And then obviously we're going to say, hey, print the, the content of this file uh, and then use that as your secret. Uh, let me go ahead and get the secret. So I'm going to copy this command and execute it right here. And it will not show me the actual secret. It will say, hey, I have this secret that is called OpenAI. So that's pretty good. So the first thing to notice is we have created a resource. So look at this thing, right? Without having a YAML file. So that is one way to do it. And throughout this, uh, th th this workshop, we will do things in different ways, just to kind of illustrate different ways of doing it. So this is the first one. You can create a resource without the YAML file. Just say create, what is it that you want to create and then pass the other parameters that are needed. So the next thing we created is a config map. And this time we are going into the chat up directory. And now instead of saying create and then passing the parameters, we're saying create a resource based on this specific uh, file, right? I can actually copy this and execute it again. It doesn't affect anything because when I do, it will basically say, hey, this is unchanged. So let us open this and take a look at what's inside this, this file. And I have it here. So let's see, this is, let me close this out. This is the config map.yaml and it's very straightforward. Look at this. It has a key value parameter. So we have a DB URL, a URL for accessing the DB. It's actually, should it be a URL? the back end URL, right? So this will be needed by the front end because the front end needs to basically access this. So this is some data that we need to pass uh, into the front end. It's not exactly like that for our purpose, but that's how config is being used. Um, so basically we describe all of this, right? We basically says the kind is config and notice that the command itself, this command, doesn't say what a resource you wanna create. However, it does specify where you want to create it. So minus N is for namespace. You can also say minus minus namespaces. Uh, we're basically saying deploy the resources in this file inside this namespace. You can also specify the namespace inside the configuration file itself if you want to, right? Uh, and I think that would be the best, the better option. And we have examples that shows that as well. So with that, uh, let me scroll down. Let's check our work. You can always get and describe things. So let's execute both of these. Uh, let me control C, paste both of them. Uh, maybe that was too much. Uh, so this is the git config and look at that. We have the back end deployer. This is what you just created now. And we have another configuration that was there by default, right? We're not worried about that. Now, uh, we can say something like describe this specific uh, config map that we created, and it will give us a description saying, hey, it has two items, backend URL and DB URL, and these are the values in there. 
I can reference these values inside other configuration, which we will see in task three. So with that, task three is about deploying the application. We will begin with the WeV8. And once we get to that, we will go back and configure it. Any questions on task two? Straightforward, right? Nothing too fancy. All right, let me set the meeting for another 10 minutes, just because we want to leave time for discussion. And uh, if you have any questions about task two or three, please feel free to drop them. By the way, if the key, what do you guys think happens if you paste the wrong key or like something like that? How do you think that will affect our work? It will probably not affect the Kubernetes aspect, right? But the application is not going to run. You will still see the UI, right? But then you will talk to that chat app and it's not going to respond back. Who has finished task three? Who can see the application right now? Nice. Do you like it? No, probably not. <laughs> it's like the most basic thing, right? Um, it's really funny. So the uh, the HTML and CSS was created by ChatGPT. I was like, hey, I need like an interface. Can you do this? And then I added the JavaScript aspect of it. The JavaScript, if you if you have time to look into it, it's pretty cool actually. The JavaScript, not the CSS. Let's see. So uh, we have a question about the command that execute, uh, that gets you a shell inside the front end. Um, what is it exactly that's not working? Like you can't access it, like you do not see the shell. Once you execute that command, you should see shell in there. Is that what's not working? And can you verify that when you echo the front end pod name that you actually see the pod name? All right, let's do the walkthrough because we have a lot to talk about in step three. So let's go back to step three. So the first component is the WeV8 database, right? Which is not an active participant in this case, but it's important to see how that works. And you can see that all we need to do, let me actually copy this command and then execute it. Uh, it's not going to make any changes. By the way, do you guys see the screen properly? I hope it's not too small. Um, but in any case, so kubectl, we are applying some resources in Aviata chat, uh, chatbot namespace. And this is what we're going to create. So we create db. Let's open that file and take a look at what's inside. Where is that? There we go. So let me do this. So check this out. In this case, we're not really building our own container. Uh, let's talk about what this is. This is a deployment, right? And the deployment will create a pod as well. And uh, it will create a pod based on the configuration that we have. So check this out. We have a name, right, for this specific deployment. We have labels, so project of the other chatbot and app with you. So that's how we identify this specific portion or deployment or pod. Uh, so we're going to give it a name, we view it. And then we have the specifications. So replicas is one. So the replica sets that's going to create it, we need only one. So we need one pod. You can play with this and you will see how you will be able to create more than one. Um, and then we have all of these different configuration. And most importantly is the environment variables that we need to set. Notice that we have some ports that we need to expose. And this comes straight from the documentation of WeV8, right? Um, WeV8, the container that we got, actually let me uh, get that. This is, uh, we missed it. This is the image. And this image comes with specific configurations that are needed. Um, so you have these two ports need to be open. And then we have certain environment variables that we need to be created. So these are all coming from the documentation itself. And they have to do with what type of model do you want to use, certain configuration that are specific to this application. What we really care about is this portion right here. We need to set the key, right? So this is the open AI key. Uh, and what we're saying is we have an environment variables that's going to be set inside that container. And the value of what information is going to be there is coming from the secret called OpenAI and look for the key that's called OpenAI key. 
So if you have that set in the previous step properly, it will be automatically fetched and inserted inside that specific uh, that specific uh, container. With that, if you've done this correctly, then WP8 will run and it will it will work. Now, in this YAML file, just like most of the YAML files that we have, we're actually creating two resources, not one. So the first one, let me scroll all the way up. The first one is a deployment, which will create a pod. The second one is a service. And the service is basically what will expose this pod. So the deployment could have one or multiple pods. We have chosen one. And then it will have internal IP addresses. The service is going to create an IP address that is for this set of entire pods. So when you need to access the service while well, you access it via the, the IP address or the name that is associated with that specific service. And you can see that you also have port mapping as well. We are saying map port 8080 to 8080. So the container is going to have 8080 open, listen to it, and we're going to have the service as a some sort of a proxy, if you will, and that will be receiving traffic on that. So that's the first step. Let me go back and scroll a little bit down and see what are we going to do next. Uh, let's actually do this. And uh, we wanted to point out that you have multiple ways of printing the outputs. One of them is minus O for output JSON. Um, you will see that there are other things that says minus O wide, which gives you more information. The default is just a table. Let me copy both of these and just show you how that looks like. So basically, get me uh, get me the service that is called VV8 that lives inside this namespace. And this is the one, it's, it's a type of cluster IP address. It has an IP address that is mapped to all of the pods that are behind it. All right, and then you can see the port mapping as well. You can also do the same thing, but minus O JSON, which will, which will output the same information plus others in a JSON format. This is very handy when you need to extract specific information for automation purposes. We would see examples of that in a minute. Uh, the next thing is, let me go down, and uh, now we talk about the backend. And the backend is very, very similar. Let me deploy this again. Uh, actually, we don't really need to deploy the game, but let's actually look at the file itself. So this is the backend.yaml. Uh, let me find that, backend.yaml. So again, it follows the same thing, right? It has as a deployment, and if you scroll down, it has a service. So it's creating two resources. Um, let's take a quick look. It follows the same principles, right? We have labels. The app is backend. Notice that the project has the same label for all. Uh, again, one replica. Uh, what else do we have? Let's see. Look at this. The image is coming from backend, which is the image we pushed earlier. And we're also and we're also setting up the OpenAI key and we are setting the DB URL. So look at this. This is a good comparison between how we configure secrets and how we configure config map. So the OpenAI key is coming from a secret, so value from secret reference, while the DB is value from config map reference. So we wanted to point out the two differences in here. They're not really that different. Uh, this is treated as a secret, essentially. The service is very much the same, right? We will give it a name, and then we will have port mapping as well. This is 8000. So 8000 is the port on which we can reach the uh, backend. Notice that the type is load balancer, and that's because we will expose the backend. It's for the backend, but it is going to be exposed externally because it's an API. That's how most applications work this time. Maybe like the backend as a name is not the most accurate, actually. Uh, but we left it just because it's easier uh, to, uh, to understand. Once you deploy this, the next step is to check. So check this out. We're going to get the services. So we're going to get all the services that are running. So let me clear the screen and then run get service. So look at that. We have front end. So, well, you don't have front end, but I do have front end because I, I did it already. Uh, but basically, we have a service. We have a cluster IP address. So note the difference between the VV8 and the backend, the VV8 has a cluster IP address, but it does not have an external IP address, right? Because in the configuration, we said the type of VV8 service is cluster IP, while the type of the backend service is a load balancer. You can still see it here. And that means there will be an IP address that is associated with this load balancer. 
This IP address is going to be exposed externally via the proxy, right? We're gonna do some uh, some kung fu in, in there. Uh, thanks to Ben for coming up with this genius idea. But you can see the mapping as well. We're mapping port uh, 8000. The next thing we had to do is to look at the pods. Now notice that we did not create pods per se. We didn't specifically say create pods, but the pods are being created as part of the deployment. So let me clear this up and then get the pods. So check this out. Remember how we said we have one replica for each, each component that we're creating? So if we had two, we would see two backends. We only have one. So this is backend deployment pod. You can see there's a status. Please make sure that everything is running. Sometimes if something wrong happens, if the container dies, you will see the status causing you an issue. Um, you should see all of it running. And we have one pod, i.e. one container, per deployment that we have. And this was created as a result of the deployment that we have. All right, so let's see. Once you go down, uh, the, the front end is very, very similar. Let's actually take a look at the front end.yaml. Um, and let's see, we are running a little bit tight on time. So the front end.yaml, it follows the exact same thing. Note that it does not need the secret. It only needs the back end URL. Um, this is actually hard coded, so this is not really needed. It's just I left it there to, to show the point. Everything else is very similar to the back end, right? Uh, just the only difference is obviously the image, but also the, uh, the port. We will access the front end via this port. All right, so finally, uh, we can take a look at everything we created. So get all will list, not all, but most of the resources or many of the resources. Uh, it will not list the config map and the secrets. Therefore, I have them in a different, com a different command. Notice that you can get multiple uh, component types via the comma. So let me execute this. Uh, clear. Oops. It's clear. And then we're going to make this a little bit bigger. And these are all of the different components that we created so far. All right. Sounds good. Let me scroll down. Now we want to test the connectivity, right? We're going to do this quickly. Um, I'm going to run this thing right here. And that, just clear again. It will show me the IP address because I added the white, right? The minus O white. So I need more information. And it will show me the IP address of the backend deployment. I'm going to copy this. And um, because I need it for the second command, which would be basically, hey, get me. So let me, let me copy all of this. Uh, this will get me the front end pod name, and I will use that to execute a shell inside that so that I can actually access that specific container. So let me copy all of this and uh, put it in here. And now you can see that my shell has changed. I am inside the container now, and I can do something like curl HTTP, not HTTPS, and then I'm going to, oops, I'm going to paste, oops, that's that was a mistake. Let's so curl HTTP, and then I'm going to copy this IP address. And the idea I want to see if the backend is reachable. Let me just finish up the command. I'm going to copy the rest of it. Notice that it says eight thousand. That the that's the port for the backend, and then there's a specific URL like API LLM, and then some sort of a query. If you put this in we should see a response back. And basically it's saying, hey, the question was, who are you? And if you can read this, it says, hello, I am Aviata chatbot, et cetera. Once you have this running, the last step uh, is to basically set the DNS. I'm not gonna go over this just because of time. I already ran it. If you wanna check your work, just cat the ETC hosts. Uh, let me look like this. And once you do, this is what will be added as a result of these commands. So we are mapping these two IP addresses, which are the external IP addresses for the services with specific URLs that we have. You can access these URLs, right? This is our app. And uh, let me just open it real quick. Uh, let me refresh. So this is your app and I have the developer tools network open just so, can you, so you can see how the communication is going. And I'm going to say, hello, can you teach me uh, Kubernetes? And you can see that in the back end, it's going, so look at that. This is Aviata chatbot, that's the front end. 
This is Aviata backend, which basically check out getting the information. And uh, look at that. That's the response coming from OpenAI. This is just a proxy for OpenAI, right? It didn't do anything fancy. Um, it did like tiny tweaks and that's it. So with that, we can see that the application is working. We can also access the backend directly, right? You can send it directly. So uh, for example, you can send like whatever query you need and you will see the response is in JSON. And uh, look at that, there's like some, I asked it earlier, like who is Sam? You know, Sam, the CEO of OpenAI. Uh, okay, so with that, let's see. We kind of ran a little bit out of time. Any questions so far before we continue? All right, so with that, I'm going to do the walk around the walkthrough for the network access control. It's a short one, right? Because all that we're going to do is we're going to deny all of the access. And then I will leave it to you guys to go and fix the application. That's not actually part of it, but the solution is in your uh, in your file. You can see that we have multiple network policies. We will apply one that's the default, which is basically deny all traffic from everything. And then it will be up to you to fix it. But before that, let me demonstrate the namespacing thing. That's what the uh, task for is all about. So check this out. We need to create another namespace that's called application two, right? Whatever that is. Let me do that. I think it's already created, but let me let me check. Uh, all right, so name application two is created. The next thing we wanna do is that we wanna create a deployment. So check this out. So now we're creating a deployment, but it's not based on YAML file. It's just like a basic deployment, right? And we're basically passing the parameters. So we're saying the app, we're gonna call it app two deployment, and we're going to use engine X image, just the generic engine X. Once we do that, we will print the pods that live in uh, application two, just to verify what we have created. It will be a single container. So if we paste that, so check this out. So application container, uh, the app two was created and check this out. Get me the PO, PO for pods. It's a typical thing. Once we do that, we have one pod and this is the name of the pod. You can see the status is creating the container. Let me run this again, just to kind of see, give it time. Now it says running, right? It will take like, I don't know, 20 seconds or something like that. All right, so once you do that, we're going to go inside. So now we have another application that's running in a separate namespace, but what's gonna happen if we try to access our own infrastructure? So let me copy this. Um, actually, before I do that, I wanna make sure. So kubectl, uh, minus m, yeah. Network policy, just to make sure that I have uh, all right, so there are no network policies. All right, that's good. I wanted to check if I do have any network policies and you can, as you can see, there are none. So let me go back and copy this thing that, well, you can see the output JSON and then we're using JQ. If you haven't used JQ before, it's pretty cool. Uh, you can basically filter down a specific item of the JSON output. And in this case, we would like to take the name uh, because obviously we're trying to fetch the name for that specific pod. Uh, so let me copy this. The next command is going to basically get us a shell inside that container. So let me do that. Go to clear and then paste. And now I have a shell inside this application too. So the goal is I want to see if I can reach the, uh, the pods, uh, the back end pods. Oh, I actually forgot to get the IP address for the pod. Let me do this again. So exit, paste this thing. So now what we have done is get me all the pods inside Aviata chat, but grip for the backend deployment. So I only have this pod and what I need is this IP address. That's what I'm looking for. Um, all right. So with that, let me go back inside my shell and I'm going to do curl HTTP and then this IP address. And then we're going to paste the rest of it. I think it's, uh, it's here. So again, we're just sending a random query. And let me check. And you can see 
uh, that can actually access the backend. So even though it's a separate namespace, but it still can access that. Also notice that the IP addresses are kind of all the same. They're within the same subnets, right? We can separate that uh, later on. But for us to fix this issue, what we can do is apply network policies. So check this out. So you're supposed to be able to access the, net, the, the backend from a different namespace unless you deploy this network policy. And what this network policy does is that it denies access to the, your application. Let me copy this, apply it first. So let me do paste and uh, network policy deny all. It's funny that it says unchanged. I think I missed this up. Uh, let me do that. Uh, let's explore the deny all. And in the deny all, it basically says, hey, check this out. The kind is a network policy and the network policy is has a name, right? Deny everything ingress. Uh, and apply it to a namespace. So check this out. We didn't specify the namespace. Remember when we did the deployment earlier, we had to specify the namespace. In this case, we didn't because it's already here. Um, so once you apply that, your network is supposed, you're not supposed to be able to, to retrieve or to access the pods. Um, so with that, it's a quick walkthrough. I'll give you some time to go through this. Give the shot, test it out. And then let me know if you have questions. We still have six minutes. I thought we we're gonna do the run through and then allow you time for questions. Uh, with that, any questions so far? Now, just a side note. Once you block access to the application, go back here. You can remove, you can test it out, right? And you can delete this policy to fix it or you can apply more policies that allow. And the policies, again, are inside the repo. Uh, feel free to explore and see how that would work. Okay, uh, let's give it a few more minutes. So we have a question, uh, anonymous. Uh, you have a note that says question about, are you referring to the question about the OpenAI key? or the question about the issue you are having with the front end pod. If it is the front end pod, can you paste a screenshot for that? And let me know what is it that's not working for you. Like, are you unable, because they, these are two sets of commands, right? Are you unable to fetch the name of the front end pod or are you unable to go in and execute a shell on the pod? And if your questions is about the open AI key, I can go over that again. So the block all, this one will block all traffic, right? You will not be able to access your uh, your pods externally or internally or whatever. Uh, but then we have two other policies that will basically allow access back to the front end and to the back end. Just feel free to play with it. They're not the easiest thing to work with, but they will make sense later on. All right, so as we wrap up, just a few reminders. So evaluation, we really care about that. Uh, I mean, Hayes is, uh, has pasted that, that's pretty cool. Um, also, chapter four is going to be about securing EKS. So this one is a very good introduction to the next one, right? Where we we'll actually create um, an EKS cluster and we will see what are some of the security issues that could, uh, that could happen there. Uh, there's a link for, registering, for registration for chapter four. Uh, attacking and detecting Kubernetes, right? And just remember what we said earlier at the beginning, uh, when we said we need to understand how Kubernetes work if we are to secure it. So if you're interested in the security aspects of Kubernetes, chapter four is basically the next step. All right, so with that, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We had a ton of questions. Hopefully we answered all of them. If you still have questions or if you still need to work on that. I will leave the OpenAI key operational for the next hour or so, so you can still test it out. Um, I will also be on chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I will be available and will answer uh, questions. Uh, I also would like to point out, remember that this repo where the Aviata chatbot is, I'm gonna paste it again in the chat. Uh, I'll copy it here. This is will always be available. You can use it today. 
or you can use it later on. Uh, but if you are going to use it tomorrow or any other day, you will have to create your own OpenAI key for this to work, for the application to work. Um, you can run this on Minikube or you can run this in any other phone that you want. Uh, with that, thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Hayes, for, for the support. And looking forward to see you next time. Have a good one, everyone.